there, students. I'm at the AP European History Reading, and I'm surrounded by scholars here, and I was actually able to uh, corner one. Uh, this is Dr. Enrique Sanabria. He is a professor at the University of New Mexico, and he specializes in the history of modern Spain. Now, a lot of times in a European history course, a teacher doesn't have a whole lot of time to talk about Spain, maybe after the Golden Age and the Spanish Armada, maybe we don't have the time, or maybe, like in my case, we don't know a whole lot about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Spanish Civil War and particularly Francisco Franco, Generalissimo Franco, who was a dictator there, and you know, just kind of the historiography of Franco. He's somebody that's kind of hard to pin down, so I thought I'd bring an expert on modern Spain. Enrique, would you like to tell them a little bit more about yourself? Pleasure. Uh, yeah, Enrique Sanabria. Um, I uh, currently am an associate professor at the University of New Mexico, which is in Albuquerque, um, New Mexico. Um, PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and my master's is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, undergrad from Santa Clara University. Um, and yeah, my interests include um, things like a social cultural history of Spain, um, sport history, um, but pretty much everybody who works on modern Spain is actually kind of concerned about the Spanish Civil War in some way or another. Uh, I wrote a book on anti-clericalism, which is kind of all sorts of anti-church, anti-Catholic discourse put forward by Republican journalists and politicians in the late part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, uh, which was both nationalistic but also anti-church. Well, that's great. I'm looking forward to learning a little bit. So at this point, I'm going to kind of turn this over to Dr. Sanabria, and we are going to have a little conversation about uh, the Generalissimo and see what we can learn about him and the historiography, particularly when it comes to fascism and that sort of thing. So Enrique, first of all, how did Franco come to power in the midst of the Spanish Civil War? I and most of my students you know, know there was a civil war in Spain, but what, what, was, what was going on there? And maybe just kind of tell us about who Franco was. Sure. Well, um, the Spanish Civil War is certainly a very complicated um, uh, conflict that brought about a complete rupture of two Spain, the Catholic conservative traditional Spain um, that we generally call the nationalist or the national movement on the one hand, and also liberal progressive Republican Spain. Um, and during the Napoleonic period, going way back into the 19th century, these two Spains kind of emerged and were at odds over the course of the 19th century, um, politically, culturally, um, socially, economically, you name it. And by the time we get to 1931, um, the monarchy is no longer kind of acceptable to the majority of people in Spain. So a republic uh, is declared once the king is going to be, uh, understands that the military is not going to support him. So we have a republic from 31 to 36 where liberals and a coalition of, of republicans and socialists are in power and they go about really trying to introduce a great deal of change very quickly in Spain. Um, and wind up getting voted out of power by the by coalition on the right, and you can see that the that the tension between the, the right and the left, the Catholic conservative Spain on the right, and the liberal progressive Spain on the left, were just not getting along, and it just continues to get very much. Um, it, it gets worse and worse. So that in 1936, when the coalition, the left of the coalition, wins, their um, their general elections, a coup led by General Franco um, initiates the Spanish Civil War, a uh, three year long uh, uh, protracted civil war that really is a civil war. It's between the two Spains. But of course, it's going to be a war that also features the assistance of Hitler and Mussolini on Franco's side and the assistance of Stalin on, on the Republican side. Franco himself um, comes from a well to do military family in Galicia, which is the north um, western corner of Spain. He comes from a military family um, and not particularly uh, a brilliant cadet or anything like that, but he does kind of gain a lot of esteem among his colleagues. And um, when the Republic was in power, he was a bit of a suspicious character. The Republic wasn't sure if he was um, on the side of the Republic or if, you know, if some civil war were to happen, would he side with the military or the nationalists? And so 
because he was a little untrustworthy, he was sent, uh, he was actually stationed in the Canary Islands um, to kind of be away from other generals that the Republic wasn't sure about. Um, and um, with the assistance of some private funding and with the assistance of the people who kind of inspired the coup, Franco was able to fly to Morocco from the Canary Islands and invade Spain in July, I'm sorry, June of 1936, initiating that war. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible war, obviously, that, that it's a civil war, uh, of course, uh, but the assistance from the Soviet Union for the Republic, the assistance from Hitler and Mussolini on Franco's side probably didn't decide the war one way or the other, um, but it certainly made this war a three-year war. It protracted the war by giving guys, you know, um, better ma military material to, to work with. Um, but it's a civil war, and it's a war in which the right, the nationalists, the Catholics, the traditionalists could come together under the language of this is a crusade, we're protecting Spain from communists and Republicans and, um, um, and socialists, whereas the socialists and the anarchists and the Republicans are unable to come together. And that really ultimately spells the defeat for the Republic. They can't get their act together. Franco and the nationalists, the Catholic Church, the, the Falange movement, the Spanish fascist movement can all congeal or come together in a way like the, that the Republic cannot. Okay, and this, uh, this Falange movement, which oh. I think, yeah, for a lot of people, we would read it uh, Falange or something like Falange, that. Now, right. Falange, Falange, now, okay, so Falange, what, what, was, what was this movement exactly? Interestingly enough, it is a veritable fascist movement in the sense that it was inspired by, um, it was actually founded by Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, Primo de Rivera, and that's an important family name. His father, Jose Antonio, was actually a military general who was in power as a, as a dictator in the 1920s before the Republic. Um, and uh, so it's a really kind of powerful family, military family name. It, it's a movement that was looked at Italy and what was happening inside of Italy, anti-communist, anti-socialist, highly nationalistic. It has a lot of the kind of trappings of, that we associate with fascism. Um, but what's kind of important to keep in mind about the fascist movement uh, in Spain is that it was actually quite small. Uh, and this is really one of the most kind of biggest misconceptions of the Spanish Civil War is that this was a war between communism and um, fascism, and that's just not the case. The fascist movement was just it was quite tiny, and the communists, the strictly speaking, the communists, meaning those that uh, adhered to Moscow for uh, or looked to Moscow for leadership, and that's different than socialists. You know, were also a tiny group as well. Okay, so so there's a tendency, I guess, for casual observers maybe to marginalize this civil war and make it look like it was a war between these two extremes where there are a lot of people that are kind of caught in the middle of this or taking sides from the so middle. So I don't think it's marginalization so much as simplification, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to, uh, to buy the argument that it was communism versus fascist because that's what was used. In other words, the propaganda that the fascist or the fascist and the Catholics and the nationalists used to portray the Republic was that they're a bunch of communists and they're going to collectivize your land and they're going to take your factories, right? But the language that the, that the, that the anarchists and the communists and the socialists and the Republicans used for portraying the right was that they're a bunch of fascists and that Hitler and Mussolini can happen here in Spain. Um, so, but again, it's much more complicated than that, right? Uh, there were very few communists and there were very few um, fascists, um, and it was more of a battle between these two, two Spains, these two visions of Spain, Catholic conservative traditional Spain, and then also liberal progressive, um, liberal progressive Spain. Okay, so you mentioned that there was a coup, and was the coup in 1936? There was I have an that attempted right? coup. Okay. There was an attempted coup. Uh, Franco and a bunch of military uh, leaders, uh, generals, uh, declared a coup against the Republic and had a full intention of taking over the state. Um, the And that happened in July, June of 1936. Is it June or July? 
summer of 1936. Summer of 1936. Let's go with that. And um, it didn't happen as they had thought it would because um, um, a large majority of the military were loyal to the to the rebel generals, Franco, uh, including Franco. Most of the Navy, on the other hand, was not. Uh, much of the Navy sided with the Republic. And pretty much the meager Air Force, the small Air Force that Spain has, winds up becoming um, Republic as well. So the military was not in unison with Franco and the rebel generals. And so, you know, it, it the initial phases of the Spanish Civil War reach a stalemate. Um, um, until Franco is able to get aid from Hitler and Mussolini. Okay, well that's okay. So really, this is the difference from a coup, a la Napoleon or something like that. A, a successful coup takes shape like this, and this coup was not put down, but it was also not successful, and you lead to this Correct. protracted civil war. Correct. Okay, and and this is where we kind of come to the crux of of what I'm sort of interested in, as far as this big historiographical question about Franco and fascism. Now you've mentioned Hitler and Mussolini, and of course they are assisting Franco. Now, how would you describe the relationship between Franco and fascist dictators like Hitler and Mussolini? Was there affinity? Was it pragmatic? Was it a bit of both? One of the things that's important to keep in mind about um, Franco himself is that while he, um, while he's certainly a military man, and he's not necessarily one of these kind of, he's not a inherently or com in, uh, essentially a fascist, in the sense that, you know, um, he admires Mussolini um, tremendously, <coughs> um, not so much Hitler, um, and uh, he does kind of look to Mussolini for the type of leadership that he wants for for Spain, um, the type of organization, but he's not like, um, he's, he's really a military dictator. Mussolini and Hitler although Hitler is a military veteran, they're not exactly military men. They're really kind of leaders of this vanguard, pioneer, anti-socialist movement that's hyper-nationalist. And the, some of those things are in Franco as well. But I wouldn't necessarily, and much of the historiography, the people that write about Franco, wouldn't necessarily call him a fascist. Now there is uh, uh, some, there are some professors, some historians who, insist that he is in cut in the same kind of uh, pattern as Hitler and Mussolini, but most people kind of see him as a traditional authoritarian military man um, who uses the fascist movement in Spain to, um, to, but he also uses the Catholic Church and he also uses the military to kind of create that coalition that's going to be in power after the Civil War um, is complete. During that, the Civil War to mobilize resources, but also to build his regime after the Civil War is created, is, is ended. Okay, so so Franco has more of a conservative streak where Mussolini and Hitler would have more of a radical sort of streak about Absolutely. them. Absolutely, I think one of the things that we should remind students, um, uh, certainly at this level, is that uh, fascism is not a conservative movement. It often gets labeled as something from the right, and it does become a force for the right, but it's really kind of, both uh, completely frustrated with liberalism and it's also frustrated with communism and it seeks a different path from liberalism and from communism and it and it it often uh, and, and that also means that it's also anti-conservative because a conservative is somebody who wants to keep the status quo the, without change or, or not kind of keep things as they are uh, a fascist is actually quite revolutionary but they're not revolution. They're not. They're not in revolt or fighting for a revolution for workers, international workers. They don't like that. They want a hyper nationalistic community of Germans or of Italians or of Spaniards. So when we think about that, the fascism in that way, anti-liberal, anti-parliamentarian, anti-communism, anti-socialist, it's also anti-conservative. Um, and Franco is highly you know, deeply conservative, Catholic, traditionalist, uh, kind of a, a very traditional military man. 
And that's one thing, I guess, that students need to understand about fascism, that it's not conservative, which I think some people would tend to place that. Like, have, have any histori- aren't there historians who've kind of put that label onto fascism or? Perhaps, um, I don't know about historians, honestly, mm-hmm. it, it have gone that route. Um, you know, I think what happens is that because it's anti-socialist and anti-communist, it must be, an- it must come from the right. Another thing that happens is historically, Hitler and Mussolini gain a great deal more traction and momentum once they convince the Catholic Church or they convince members of the middle class or they convince the aristocracy in Germany and Italy that that if they join the fascist movement that um, the communists will be destroyed right in Germany and in Italy which ultimately winds up happening in Germany Uh, and so what winds up happening is once the fascist movement or the Nazi movement or the Falange begin to court the, the church, the Catholics, the, even the Lutherans in Germany, the, the Junker class in Germany, the landowning class, the elites in those countries, fascism seems to move to the right, but it's still ultimately revolutionary. It doesn't see kind of the conservative values that much of the people on the right are, are, are fighting for or, or trying to protect. And meanwhile, the people that Hitler and Mussolini had to convince to join them, these are the people who are already part of Franco's movement, as uh, far as the church, the Spain. conservatives, right, in Spain. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think that, that um, what winds up happening is that Catholics and landowners and factory owners, um, elites, um, feel kind of attacked in many ways by the Republic which was trying to, uh, which one, gives all sorts of, um, makes all sorts of efforts to kind of curtail the power of the Catholic Church in Spain, secularizing education, separating the church from the state uh, with the 1931 constitution, uh, granting women the right to vote. Um, There's all sorts of kind of these liberal progressive uh, attempts that Catholic conservative traditional Spain fears um, and that's why Franco seems to offer them the promise of protecting their interests. Okay, that's okay. So that's that's interesting as far as what part of that coalition that he's starting from. All right, now Franco was in power for a long time. How how long did his government last? Well, he uh, the Civil War formally ends in the spring. Um, actually, the winter of nineteen thirty nine, and and so he is formally you know, the head of the state from 1939 until his death in November of 1975. So if you think about that, that's, you know, uh, that's quite, uh, I believe that's 36 years or something like that, is that right? Um, A long time. Um, The beginning part of the dictatorship is marked by, you know, some really hard times because the regime itself lacks legitimacy. You know, in an age where liberal democratic elections are uh, are privileged as the way that you form a government. He won power through his own uh, might, essentially. Might doesn't necessarily make right, but um, so he lacked legitimacy at the very beginning um, because Europe is at war. Nobody's trading with Spain. Even after the war, Spain is surrounded by kind of um, winners of World War II who don't like pseudo-fascist or fascist dictators. And so Spain goes through a really tough time in the 1940s, um, um, suffering years of hunger um, and lack of trade, um, at least until the, the, the kind of the beginning years of the 1950s, mid 50s, when things change around once the United States kind of begins to normalize relations with Spain. Okay, so at first, immediately after the war, here's a guy that was on friendly terms with Hitler and Mussolini controlling the government in Spain, which wasn't a very palatable idea for the Allies. But then I guess as we move into the 1950s, we're in the midst of the Cold War and Franco is going to keep Spain from becoming communist and root out communists there, that there right. becomes, the, the United States warms up to a friendly relationship with Spain. Yeah, ultimately the Cold War informs the United States' decision to uh, to uh, a kind of approach Franco and 
um, and offer all sorts of material aid to Spain in the form of loan credits and in the form of food, um, kind of extensions of the Marshall Plan that were used to rebuild France, Germany, England after World War II in exchange for military bases that the United States needed on the Iberian Peninsula on Spanish soil. Uh, and that really begins to kind of stimulate Spain's economy, which was really plummeted and hurt by the Spanish Civil War, and also by the fact that, you know, Europe was at war and Spain had no trading partners from 1939 to 1945, and then was on the outs, right? The word is ostracism. It was ostracized from the international community, not allowed to be a member of the United Nations, for instance, um, until um, much later. Um, but things, again, do change because the United States is very concerned about the Soviet, Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union, and wants to prevent the spread of communism. Um, and Franco has had proven himself to be, okay, maybe he was a pseudo-fascist dictator, but he always hated communists, and America loved that about him. Now, let me let me kind of look at maybe Franco's legacy. So between 1950, when the United States is becoming more friendly, and the mid-1970s, he's in power. Now, of course, today, I, I was reading that not too long ago that the last statue of Generalissimo Franco was taken down that his his memory is kind of taboo today now what was what was Spain like during this time and what has been kind of the the memory of Franco that's made him such a contra such a controversial figure in historical memory sure well I think that you you certainly need to understand that Spain was torn apart by the Civil War um, in 1936 to 1939 and and again, not being able to trade with the world um, and, uh, beyond 1945 meant again that Spain struggled. It had the so-called years of hunger. The 1940s were called the years of hunger. Um, and, um, and also there's a, a great deal of kind of being vindictive. Franco and the framers of the Franco dictatorship were very vindictive um, against Republicans and socialists and anarchists, the other Spain. And so th they imprisoned and executed tens of thousands of those folks. They forced hundreds of thousands of refugees to go to France in 1939. There's also a brain drain. In other words, some 150,000 um, left um, Spain to go to Argentina or to go to Mexico or go to the United States or go to Canada. Many of them were university professors. Uh, like me, who wound up uh, kind of teaching at uh, uh, North American institutions, um, but they could not necessarily reconcile themselves or feel safe in Franco Spain throughout the 1940s, maybe even into the 50s. What's kind of interesting about the transformation that Spain has, beyond the American credits that I uh, addressed earlier, is that uh, beginning in the late part of the 50s and into the 1960s especially, Northern Europe and also pretty much France, Germany, Western Europe does really well. They have an economic boom and there's a lot of discretionary income that those folks have and they're vacationing in affordable places and the most affordable place for Europeans to go, you know, bathe in the sun is Spain. And so what winds up happening is that tourism, especially into Spain in the 1960s, transforms Spain because it requires, you know, uh, the building of beautiful hotels. Uh, it also requires kind of improvements in sewage because, for believe it or not, tourists don't like to swim in sewage uh, in the uh, Mediterranean Ocean. It also kind of has to lift restrictions on censorship because, you know, a German tourist in Spain is not going to be happy to see his newspaper censored. The bikini, for instance, the scandalous piece of clothing for Spaniards you know, was not a big deal for Swiss, uh, for Swede Swedish women, for instance, or for French women who are vacationing down there. And so the, just how Europe behaved, how Europe spent its discretionary money kind of exposed Spaniards to a world that was very different from the, the tough luck and the hard luck that they were experiencing. Uh, and it leads to more and more Spaniards wanting to be like the rest of Europe and enjoy that type of leisure and enjoy that type of success and enjoy 
you know, cars and refrigerators and TVs that Franco, Franco Spain didn't necessarily have until the 1960s. When there's an economic boom, triggered again by the United States in large part, but also by the fact that trade relationships get normalized with other countries, and then there's all this tourism that's going into Spain. And interestingly enough, Franco uh, and uh, his Minister of Tourism were really eager to kind of get people to think of Spain as different and draw more tourist money to Spain. All right, well, thank you, Enrique. So again, we, we're here with Dr. Enrique Sanabria from the University of New Mexico, and we've been talking about Franco. So what we, what we understand now is that although General Franco is, is thought of as a fascist, we're really looking at more of an authoritarian conservative. But then again, authoritarian conservatives can also kill people like a fascist or a communist. And, and I guess that's a lot of the historical memory there as far as why he's, uh, you know, such a such a taboo figure there. Are there any closing thoughts before we sign off? Certainly, I think that, um, you know, what's going on in Spain is really fascinating because what the reason, you know, going back to original question, I mean, one of the reasons Franco is such a polemical figure right now is the fact that he is responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of Spaniards and um, and his movement was also responsible for the death of tens of thousands of people who are often, uh, were often kind of dumped in mass graves in forests and fields outside of Spain. Right now there's a desire certainly by the relatives of those people who were killed um, to have those bodies exhumated. The, party in power, the, 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 uh, the PP, the popular party, or the People's Party, is a conservative kind of uh, party that's uh, got some affiliation with the nationalists back then and doesn't really want to open that wound again. Uh, yet there are, the, we do continue to see kind of some differences between these two Spains as one wants to kind of worship, not worship, I'm sorry, kind of commemorate their dead uh, and the other Spain seems to not allow it. Um, it's just a really kind of interesting case of, because, you know, the the exhumation of bodies at these mass graves is happening primarily through NGOs, non-government organizations that are raising private funds um, in order to dig up these bodies. Um, and every time that happens, certainly, you know, this old wound between Catholic, conservative, traditional Francoist Spain on the one hand, and liberal progressive um, Spain, socialist Spain on the other, is opened up anew. And I think that's why you, you know, Franco's, the images of Franco and the statue of Franco are very polemical for, or controversial for some people. However, there are still some people that think that life is better during the Franco dictatorship. You know, there are, they might not be completely unhappy with the kind of the progressive nature of, 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 of Spain today. And so, you know, he might be taboo to some, but he continues to be in some ways a bit of a, of a hero. Um, and any kind of effort to link him with Hitler and Mussolini, um, you know, for those, for those people feels a little overstated, feels like uh, it's not true. I mean, this was a guy who was just looking after the church and Catholic traditional Spain. Okay, and, and so the whole idea, I guess, what makes Franco relevant even today is that this idea of two Spains is still there. I remember just as uh, just as an American following the news, I remember when the left-wing Socialist Party took over around 2006, one of the first things that they did was legislate gay marriage, which right. had not had not been done before that. A similar thing's been done in France just in the past few years. So we still see that sort of cultural conflict in Spain and France and several European countries. So there's still a legacy there. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I think that that's, that's certainly the case. And, and um, you know, again, um, there is this idea that, that, you know, you were better behaved or people were better behaved. Kids weren't making out in the streets. Kids weren't engaged in kind of risky behavior or rock and roll or drugs during the Franco dictatorship. Bikinis until uh, the tourism. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so I think that that kind of conservative nostalgia for Franco's um, Spain informs the misgivings that people have with the kind of, you know, permissive, uh, 
modern, um, you know, uh, Spain that's out there. Uh, so the legacy of Franco persists in that kind of group of in, the, in that kind of group of Spaniards who want to continue to, uh, you know, to kind of elevate and celebrate Catholic culture and the Catholic Church. All right. Well, I tell you what, hopefully I'll be able to do some more segments like this. I want to thank uh, Dr. Enrique Sanabria for being the first scholar to uh, appear on my channel. And hopefully sometime I'll have some more people. And be sure to comment if you got something out of the video, if you have any, any questions or you have any suggestions for other things, or tell me what you think about the format. And if you haven't subscribed already, please be sure to do that. Thanks again, Enrique. All right. Until next time.